Well, as I mentioned last week, today we're just going to see chapter one, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but as I mentioned last week, I'm still approaching our study on the book of Revelation with a sense of fear and trembling. Um, as Revelation lies beyond my area of expertise. And when I said this is because I have never taught it before, prior to teaching it here, I don't think I've ever read the entire book sitting at once. I usually do that when I'm teaching a book. I sit at once and read it in one sitting, just to get the feel of the, the entire book. But I don't think I've ever done that. Um, so, we've already prayed, and we pray we ask God for his guidance and understanding. All right, let's do a quick review from last week. I was anticipating some uh, may come in or somebody else. So I wanted us to do a quick review. Um, so as I said again last week, we approach the book of Revelation. Uh, people often approach the book of Revelation with a sense of impending danger um, or mysticism, something you can't understand. Uh, and the term apocalypse actually denotes an unveiling or revelation. It means to shed light of what was concealed, of what was hidden. That's what the word mi means. So therefore, the Bible is not, God is not trying to hide anything from us. In fact, the original audience that uh, John wrote this book to would understand exactly what he meant by the sim symbolism, the imagery, the numbers, they would understand a lot of things. And the ones that they were not able to understand, perhaps that's the reason why the, um, the angel in heaven or Jesus said, this is what this means. Okay? Uh, the goal of this Bible study then uh, is to eliminate context, correct misconceptions, and grasp its intended message. Again, as we said, the book is written by John, who identified himself as a companion in the suffering and a recipient of divine of that divine revelation. And as I told you last week, this idea is supported by early by, by early church tradition, um, and uh, that by the early church tradition that the intended audience or the second church in Asia Minor. And as explicit, explicitly stated in Revelation chapter one, verse four, that those who, the book is written to these seven churches, okay? So again, the date is, was written in the mid 70s or 90s, either during Nero or the mission's persecution. Um, church historian favors the mid 90s during the mission persecution um, in church, church history um, um, support that. The purpose of the book, again, I'm very big on this. Um, well, Helen Robinson is very big on this for preaching. And I think I took it and I'm very big on it, not just for preaching, but for any book you're studying, is to find the purpose of the book. And once you understand the purpose of the book, then you can really start studying the book and, and, and understand what its implications are. So the purpose of the book is not to talk about how things are going and yes, there is thing, there are some things of, like uh, um, about, there are certain things of this in the book, but the purpose of the book is to encourage a suffering church. The book was written to encourage a suffering church. And what and what 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 Jesus, what, what heaven wanted the church to know is that you are suffering, but guess what? It's going to get worse. Hold on and be faithful because God's going to win. Or God has already won. Right? If you persevere, you will win the crown of righteousness. So persevere. Right? If you persevere, you will win the crown of righteousness. So we say, what kind of book is the book of Revelation? What kind of genre 
right? We said Revelation is primarily an apocalyptic book, primarily an apocalyptic book, but it is also epistolary and prophetic, okay? Um, as you see for the first, for chapter two and three, the letters to the churches, right? So it's very, it's like an epistle, it's a letter, but there's a lot of prophetic um, ideas in, in Revelation. The outline again, uh, it has to start with a prologue, and then it ends, um, and it ends with an epilogue, right? A prologue is an introduction, and an epilogue is like a conclusion, right? Um, and the prologue is one to eight, and then you'll see the message to seven churches, verse, one, verse, verse nine to 322. Then you come to the seven seals, which is in chapter four to eight. Hello, Brad. Then you come to the seven seals, um, uh, which from chapter four one to chapter eight two. Then you have the seven trumpets. Yeah. You have the seven trumpets. Um, and then after that, you see the seven bowls. You see the seven bowls, and lastly, the final victory and the final judgment. Um, and so that, that's what's happening on earth. Then you see the heavenly Jerusalem, and then you have the epic. okay? All right, so like, like I said last week, your understanding or interpretation of Revelation will largely be based on these four factors. Your understanding or interpretation of revelation will be largely based on these four factors. So, so the first one is, do you take the imageries and the numbers literally or symbolically? All right? So if you take the, the imageries and revelation literally, and you take the numbers literally, then you will interpret it totally different than someone who takes it symbolically, the numbers or the images. So that's the first factor. So you're gonna have to make up your mind. Are these things literal or are they symbolic? Okay? Secondly, what do you take the word after this in Revelation to me? Does it mean tomorrow, immediately, a day later, 50 years later, or 2,000 years later, right? What does it mean by after this, the word meta in Hebrew, and Greek, which means after a week, right? The third one is, do you believe the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls to be a linear story, meaning one after the other, 21, 21 things that happen in linear, or do you see it as a cyclical story? That is the, the, that, that the, the, the seven seals, through the seven seals they, the, they, they tell the story, and then that goes into the seven trumpets, tell the story again, and then the seven bowls we tell the story again, right? And there are reasons to believe that it's cyclical uh, for two reasons. Because that's part of the genre of apocalyptic um, junk books. Not only they are symbolic, for most, mostly, but they are also cyclical. For those of you, not for me, I'm, for those of you who love to watch those movies, right? Like um, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, uh, what's the one C.S. Lewis? Chronicles of Narnia. Chronicles of Narnia. Like sometimes you see something happen over again, and sometimes in these books, but still telling the same story. Um, but I wouldn't know. I've, I've never watched them. Um, and lastly, do you understand the larger purpose of the book? 
right? The larger purpose of the book we just talked about. Okay? While people are looking for the imagery, they, they, they're focusing on uh, the metaphors, the numbers. What is the real purpose of the book? Again, we go back to the real purpose of the book. The real purpose of the book of Revelation is this. It's to, it's to encourage a suffering church. You are suffering and it's going to get worse. Hold on, be faithful because God has already won. If you persevere, you hold on to the faith, you will win the crown of righteousness. You will reign with Christ. That is the purpose of the book of Revelation. Okay? Alright. So I'm going to tell you from what I'm, I'm beginning to form my own opinions. As I say, I've never taught on the book of Revelation until now. And as I do my research and I've been studying, I'm beginning to make my own opinion. I favor the symbolic, um, a, a, a symbolic approach to Revelation. But symbols of real things, right? Not saying it's symbolic and it's not symbol of real thing. It's symbol of real thing. Just like, just like Jesus said to John, or the angel says to John, the seven lips are what? The seven lips stand the what? The seven churches. The seven churches. So the seven lips stand for symbolic of a real thing. Right? But if, if the angel did not say that to John, we would, know. we would never know what the seven lips stand for. Right? So, so, so even many places in the book, the angel or Jesus will tell John, this is symbolic of that, right? So the book is has a lot of uh, symbols in it. Revelation chapter one, you can find it in Revelation chapter one. Um, the the book ex, the book often explains what the symbols mean. Example, um, Revelation chapter one verse twenty, the mystery of the sevens. Star um, that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands is this: seven stars are the angels of the of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, like I said last week, I need you to pay attention to this. And Jen said it the week prior to that. Sometimes you hear people say, "I take the entire book of Revelation literally." not symbolically. What most people don't understand is that taking something literally means that you understand it or you take it exactly as the front, the author wanted you to take it or wanted you to understand it. That's what the word literally means. It doesn't mean at face value. So for instance, as David says, as the deer fed for the water. Right? So my soul long after thee. Right? Or the Lord is my shepherd. Right? Um, I shall not want. Right? So, so it's a symbol of who God is in the life of David. He sees himself as a sheep. And what does a sheep stand for? Power. Huh? Power. Uh, ignorant. Yes, <laughs> cannot, cannot, cannot lead itself. So, so David is saying, even though. I, I became a warrior, even though I became a king, even though the, the number one song in my country was out, named after me, was, was written for me, even though I have so many beautiful wives and all the riches, I need God. I need Him to lead me. Right? So, so saying the Lord is my shepherd is symbolic as to what the meaning that God has in His life. Right? So, so you, when you, you take it literally, literally means to take it exactly how it was intended to be. Secondly, I favor a mixed approach as a partial preterist and futurist. Uh, that some of the book has already happened and some of the book is yet to take place. So as you know, last week we looked at the preterists, the futurists, the idealists, and the historicists, right? 
and each of them see the book differently. And when you see the, the way you see the book, that's how you're going to interpret the book. Right? But I believe it's a mixture. I do believe I can't be a total preterist um, because they think everything already happened already, even the coming of Christ. And that's totally not biblical. Or the futurist think everything will happen after so 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 the, the people, the audience that John wrote the book to has nothing to do with chapter 4 to 22. Right? Which is totally wrong. So, so far I prefer a mix. A mixture of that. Why preterist and not historical? Wouldn't historical say these things happened? In well, historical says, historical says, like, this is not really a real set in church. It's kind of spiritual. Oh, I thought that was idealist. Um, spiritual only. Yeah, both, kind of both of them, right? Um, um, well, actually, you're right. Not that they're saying that it's spiritual, but they're saying these are different epochs of the church, okay. right? So when you see the church of, of, of Ephesus, you know, it's a different epoch from human history. And human history, yes, okay. as you go down. So, but the reason why I say uh, about um, being a, a, predis, a mixture of predators and futurists is Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 says, Write therefore what you have, what you have seen, what is now, now and what will take place later. later. What you have seen, perfect past, what is now, present, future, present continuous, and what will take place later. Right? So, so, so you have to look at it that, that way. Um, I'm not going to go through this. Um, okay, let me quickly go through it because... Um, um, so the prayer is to real quickly. The word preter derived from the Latin word pass. Everything in the book has already taken place in 7, 70 AD. Even the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the greatest witness of this view is that Jesus return according to scripture cannot take place in secret. Jesus return must take place suddenly, physically, visibly, personally, and physically. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of all people must be pitied, right? The historical view, all of the events from chapter one to four to the end of the book refers to different historical epochs Throughout the history of the world, right? The major the major weakness of this position is that they are in radical disagreement with each other. Every historicist they are they will never agree on anything, right? Some of them would say, "Well, the rise of Russia is this," and some of them say, "No, no, 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 it, 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 it's it's the rise of this, right? It's the European the the." the Asian war, or whatever war it was, right? So they never really agree with one another. You will never find um, two historicists agree on everything. Same, right? The yeah. future is... Sorry, do they also take the view that none of this is for the future? No, no, no. It's for the future as well. Because it's the church is going to go through seven epochs before Christ comes. Okay. Seven different... Um, Ages? Ages, yeah. Yeah. And so they believe the historical view says that not all of it has happened yet, or it all happened. Yeah, they don't believe all of it has happened yet. Okay. But but they believe that everything. So so meaning everything, like I so told you the last time. You see, God in my God, the Bible talks about in, in Revelation. They'll tell you, oh, this is who they are in this story, which the Bible does not, you know, clearly say. Clearly say. Yeah. The future is all of this event from chapter 4 to, to the end of the book refers to the future. Everything from there is in the future. None of the events after 4 1 applies to John's original audience. The weakness of this position is that it makes Revelation irrelevant, irrelevant to John's audience. Right? Idealists. 
The Algerians views that the events of Revelation are not tied to specific historical events. The book is symbolic and represents the ongoing struggle throughout the ages of God against Satan and good against evil. So the major weakness of this view is that it denies the book of Revelation any specific historical fulfillment. All right? So, I have the approach, I favor the approach that the seven seals, trumpets, and bowls are secret stories and not linear. That's what I favor for now, okay? When we look at when we look at it, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll debate and talk about that. Uh, lastly, I favor the central purpose of the book to be that of an encouragement to the suffering church, instead of, of, of it being a book of detailed information regarding the end, right? Regarding the end. Quick question. Sure. So to that point, what do you say about the fact that with God, that's always been how God, um, no matter how he reveals himself to people, right? That he can tell, he said what's going to happen before it happens. Mm -hmm. um, even through the old day, I think everything. But would you not say that's still a part of, of why, granted anybody's a believer who he's writing to, but there are people who aren't yet believers that will become believers in this time. I don't quite get the question. Isn't the, the actual part of predicting what's going to happen part of what makes God not what makes God God, but what, how he's always dealt with people and mankind. Yeah, well, yeah, to tell you beforehand right. what's going to happen. Yes, he did in the book of Daniel, right? Um, he's done it in Ezekiel, right? And he's doing it in Revelation, right? But what I'm saying is, is that um, from 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 the time you start from the seal to the bowl, those three, the three even the seal, the trumpets, and the bowl or not linear stories that not going to one after the other. I believe that after the seven trumpet, at seven seal, when the seven trumpet starts, it's just retelling the story in a different way. That's going to happen. And then, because if you look at the end of every single one of them, the seven seal or the seven, seven trumpet or seven bowl, it, it feels like everything is done. People are already in heaven and everything is fine. And then everything starts all over again, right? So it's just hard to say that can happen in a linear fashion. It has to be cyclical, right? Yes. But the um, the judgments and the, the the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls get progressively worse in each one. So, Are you talking get get progressively rust, rust, um, worse when from one to seven? Are you saying from seals to trumpet and to bowl? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get a chance to look at that and to compare them. Yeah, when we get there, we'll get a chance to look at it and compare it and see, you know, it, is it linear or is it cyclical? Right? Is it repeating the story or is it going in a linear fashion? Right? When we get there, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Just real quick, the linear view is like saying like the bowls are like, like let's say the seventh bowl is like the last thing. I say like the word, that's the linear says like that's the worst thing that's going to happen. No. no, no, no. So what I'm saying is, so, so the first seal happened, the second seal happened, the third seal happened, the fourth seal. They each are different things that happen, and you get to the seventh seal. But when you get to the first trumpet, you, you still add into the story. It's a new thing that's happening. When you get to the second trumpet, it's you add into the story. So that's the meaning. So he's saying he's going chronologically. It's going chronologically. Is it going chronologically, or is it retelling the story every seven? So a secular, uh, however you say it, that view is like. The bowls, the trumpets, and the and the seals Still? are the same. Yes, seven. Things. It's it's not that they are the same, but they are telling the same story in a different way. Oh, okay. Yeah. And in one here it says that there's twenty one things. Twenty one yes. things that is happening one after the other. Do they get progressively worse? Well, yeah. Well, in the inside of the 
seven. Inside of the seven, sealed inside of the seven, trumpet inside of the seven. But I could, so far what I'm looking at, I could compare them. I could put them right next to each other, and you kind of see sometimes the same thing, kind of the same intensity. But but when we get there, we'll look. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll definitely take time to look at all that to make up our mind. But I'm saying so far, I favor the sticker code. Yes. So when you said, not to change the subject, but you said what if, uh, that you believe the larger purpose, or you believe that this book is about is encouragement, and mm -hmm. not about being sort of a doomsday yeah. um, prediction of what's to come. Yeah. Do you think that some of what's in there is a prediction of what's to actually come? Well, yeah, because I told you the book, the, the book is, the, the genre is, is, is um, apocalyptic, right. Which it's epistolary, yeah. and it's also um, pro prophetic, right? right. So there's, there's, the, there's the apocalyptic part of it, there's the letter yeah. that is written to the seven churches, and then God is telling things, you know, of the future. Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Because I was going to say, the examples you gave yeah. of the other books. This one is that, imagine you're suffering, and, well, imagine during the time of Hitler, you're going into the chamber um, to die and God sends you a message. And it's just, I want to show you what's going to happen later. Like way far, far, far down. It has nothing not to do with your time, right? The book was written to say, hey, take courage. Don't give up. Because if it happens on the Domitian, Domitian wanted people to worship him as an emperor. And the Christian refused to do that. So, they were persecuted. so you'd be persecuted for that. So do you fall into apostasy, leaving the, your faith and follow the missions or follow, or follow their ways? So we'll see next week how God is talking to the seven churches, right? And saying that, I know where you live. This is what you've done. This is what you're involved with, right? Um, so, so some people were falling into it as well, right? They were falling into things that they were not supposed to. Yeah. So, so it was a warning not to fall into a process, right? Keep, keep, stay faithful. Be encouraged, right? Okay. All right. Today, today, when I have one hour, we'll try to attempt to go through chapter one, right? So the book starts with an. Uh, with a, 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 pro, a prologue made, made up of a salutation and a doxology, right? The prologue is made up of a salutation and a doxology, right? Let's read it now and I'll analyze it together, okay? We start with the um, salutation. John, the seven, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. So let's talk about the salutation. No? Just like a long story. Well, yeah, <laughs> it's going to take us some time, right? But what I want you to see is that. The salutation consists of the Trinitarian doctrine, right? Found in Genesis chapter 1, 26, right? Elohim, and as I, what do I tell you about Elohim? Anything that's not, that is in in, in Hebrew, it's is right. plural. So it's not Jehovah, not Yahweh is saying this, but it's Elohim, right? And Elohim is more than one. So we're talking about the Trinity, and I think that's why John was able to say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing was made, without Him nothing was made that had been made, right? So He was there, the, Jesus was there, in the beginning, in time of creation, so it's Elohim that says that, right? And in, in Genesis we see the, the Numa, the, the, the Holy Spirit, Right? Or we call the Ruach in Hebrew um, is what? Hovering over the surface of the earth. Right? So so John told me, John told, 
The Old Testament in Genesis doesn't tell us Jesus was there. But John tells us he was there. But it tells us that the Father and the Holy Spirit was there. Genesis tells us that. But John tells us, yeah, Jesus was there as well, right? So the heaven is the plurality, a plurality of God. It says, let us make man and what? Our. Our image. And our and our likeness, right? In Genesis. So we know the us to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, if you have any questions, you could ask, okay? It's not about rushing. If I have to stop in the middle and we continue next week, that's fine. I'd rather us having a, a good conversation about what we're learning, right? So John introduces God the Father as the eternal one. Why do I say eternal one? Him who was, who is, and who is to come. So he's introducing the Father as the eternal one. The one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. It's almost like I'm the Alpha and Omega. Right? So we're talking about the eternity of God. Yeah. But then something strange happens. I think that's what probably we're alluding to. Um, um, Herman. Instead of God, the Holy Spirit, he introduced seven spirits of God. Is it, is it what you read? The seven spirits of God? Who are the seven spirits of God? What does it mean by the seven? I thought there was only one Holy Spirit. What does it mean by the seven spirits of God? Can anybody help? Is there anything you've heard? Huh? The seven spirits of God. Is he referring to the seven angels of the churches? No. Well, if you look at it symbolically, mm -hmm. number seven is completion. Okay. So he could be oh, perfection. Perfection. He okay. Could be saying the seven spirits is a sevenfold or completed spirit. Okay. That's good as that. Yeah. Huh? Um. Well. Obviously, it's not talking about, I think it's talking about God in that sense because spirits is lowercase. <laughs> but um, never mind that, I would say, well, well let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it. Oh, Microsoft is capitalized. But, yeah, let's look at it. I, I wasn't paying attention to that. I just want to make sure. Where are we again? Um, yeah. uh, uh, grace and peace from God. God. Uh, spirits. Seven yeah. spirits. Yeah. But there's a little asterisk. What does that mean? Which one? It references, but it's a cross reference to the other passage that it's coming from. Which I've seen okay. it elsewhere. I think it's just talking about seven, I don't want to say characteristics, but seven kind of uh, um, attributes, I guess, of the Spirit. Well, then what makes it what, what makes it confusing is that it's talking about the Father, it's talking about the Son, and he introduced seven spirits. Seven spirits before the throne. Before the okay, grace and peace. Let's read it again. <clears throat> before his throne. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the first one from the from the dead and the ruler of the kings. That's, that represents the entire thing. You have God the Father, the seven spirits, and then Jesus the Son as well. Well, that, that's what you could look at, but now instead of saying the Holy Spirit says the seven spirit. And in fact, something I wasn't looking at, I'd have to look, I'll, I'll have to look um, in the Greek to see. I know it's Numa, um, meaning spirit, but but why does he put it in the why, why, why does the English writer split it and lower it? It could be a uh, In 4 5, there's a reference to uh, the throne preceded by lightning. Seven lamps of the fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? 4 5. 
Yeah. There's like, there's like a cross reference to a passage. I've seen. Oh, no, no, yeah, I will share that with you guys. Um, yeah. Um, the seventh spirit is. Um, yeah. So, they, so the seventh spirit, Angie, I'm glad that you did that. It's not just there. So, I found where it talks about the seventh spirit. So, the first one is in verse 4, right? We just read that, right? But then you have it again in Jesus' message to. Um, to the um, Sod Sod Sodus, the church of Sodus, which is 3.1. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God in the seven stars. We see the seven spirits again. Um, and then we saw it, we see it twice again in the throne room scene. 4, 5, and also 5, 6. Okay? 4, 5 says. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbling, and pearls of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lips of blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Seven in the seven throne, seven lips of blazing. These are the spirits of God. Is that then also cross-reference the other one when it says the seven? To the seven churches. Five, six, seven. Well, the seven churches are the red stem. Oh, these are the lamps. These are the, the lamps. Okay. So it's two different things. Right? Yeah, the lamp stem, because again, what do we do with lamps? We put them out. So you can see. So these are the lamp stem and these are the lamps. Right? So 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 I saw the lamp. Looking if, as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all this earth. So now it's telling us the seven spirits are said to be the seven lamps that are blazing in the seven horns. And the seven eyes. Okay. There's a set to be the seven lamps, the seven horns, and the seven eyes. So if you think of it symbolically again, and we know that seven means complete, is it the seven spirits are said to be the completed, whatever the lamp symbolizes? Mm -hmm. Seven horns, which means absolute power, and seven eyes, which means absolute knowledge. So maybe seven lamps means absolute something else. I don't know yet. You're saying the seven what? The seven blazing lamp? Right. Uh, yeah, so if you're looking at it, horns mean power, right? right? So you could think, okay, if you talk about the all power, power, powerful God, like the army, army of God, the blazing. Blazing like a laser, able to see everything, right? Is it talking about that? Is it talking about the omniscience of God, knowing all? And um, um, not, not the omniscience of God. Um, That's the seven eyes. The seven eyes, the omniscience of God. Right? But we don't know, right? And I don't know. I don't, I don't think I know. Doesn't spirits also sometimes mean, not necessarily a spirit in terms of... Uh, so, so the spirit of like not suke. But I guarantee you this have to be Numa. Uh, I didn't take a look at it. I'll take a look later. But there's a difference between suke, which is the spirit of man, and Numa, which is the spirit of God. You know, also about like the two the spirit in terms of like that one word Numa can be used multiple times. No, it's just one meaning for that one. I thought sometimes spirit could also mean like uh, personality. Like, yeah, or knowledge or some type of uh, that kind of thing. Not really. Uh, uh, okay. We'll, 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 we'll take that there. We'll stay there because we don't know. I don't know. Well, let me tell you what I've seen so far, right? What, what people have said, theologians have said this might be, right? Who are the seven spirits? So, so this is what I said myself. In attempting to answer this question, we, make it, we can make a number of observations. Let's begin with what we know for certain. If the expression seven spirit refers to the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that there are seven different spirits. 
or that the Holy Spirit is somehow divided into seven different parts. Mm -hmm. There is only one Holy Spirit. So let's start with that. We always start, when you're doing Bible study, you always start with what you know for certain. Right? Before you start going elsewhere. So we know that there's one Holy Spirit. In fact, Acts chapter 1 verse 4 to 8 tells us that there's one Spirit. John chapter 4 verse 25 to 26. Um, the Spirit is a He. Right? He will teach you. has personality. Um, he, will, um, he will teach you. The He is masculine Greek pronoun ekagos, um, which means He, instead of the neuter. Right? Because in Greek... In, in, in Hebrew, <coughs> not Hebrew, in Greek, you have masculine, you have feminine, and you have neuter, right? And just like we have in here, in, 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 America, in English, it is like neuter. You don't give it feminine or masculine. It's kind of neuter, right? So if you say she or he, but only in the third person. Only in the third person. But in Greek, it's every person. It has to have a he, she, and a neuter. Right? The pronouns. So it's not the I, there's an I masculine, there's an I feminine, and there's an I neuter. Huh. Right? So if you're talking about the table, table uh, in French, we know it's feminine. Wow. Yes. Wow. Right? And perhaps if you do it well, in English as well. Right? But no, we say the. We say the. So that's, that's the problem with English. It doesn't know. help us. But French do help us because they're like that, right? The table is feminine, right? Uh, yeah, I tend to do that too. Um, sometimes, yeah. 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 With a lot of words, they have that, like, puss or uh, I, the females in it. Puss in the All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6. There's only one body and one spirit. Just as we're called to one hope. When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we establish that there is one Holy Spirit. What then do the seven spirits refer to? There are three views concerning the seven spirits of God. Right? So far, from my research, three views. View number one. Some see it as an explanation of the spirit in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, right? In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, it reads, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Well, they take the they take they take the spirit of the Lord to rest on them. Oh. They take that to make that it first one. Okay. Yeah, which I think is a little stretch. I think it's three actually, because it's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, mm -hmm. counsel and might, knowledge and fear. Those would seem like three groupings. Yeah. And what's it? The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of fear. Then it would be six. No, I I. I I think it's six, and they stretch it to make it seven, but I don't think it's six. Because you have fear and knowledge. Those are two different things. Two different things. Would you agree? Yeah. No, fear, fear is like respect. Fear is respect. Yes. Knowledge, knowledge, and knowledge, and knowledge and understanding could go together. This, 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 oh, well, there's, a, there's a passage where it called, um, I think in um, Psalm 19, where it calls, it uses fear to mean like, Oh. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. No, 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 Sure, making wise and simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
men of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More we desire are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter than honey, and dripping through the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant born. In keeping them, there is great reward. I think God explains that. In that context, he uses fear in the same pattern of law, precepts. Well, let's read the prophet's history again. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The, the rules of the Lord are true. The fear of the Lord is what? Clean. Clean. Enduring forever. Enduring forever. And then? The rules of the Lord are true and righteous all It moved on. Uh, so, okay. so you have the law. rule of the Lord. Now start out with the rule of the Lord. You have the law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the fear, the rules. Yeah. Uh, law, testimony, precepts, commandment, fear. Rules. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't think that. All right, so in this passage, Isaiah speaks of the Spirit of the Lord in different aspects of ministry. The Spirit is mentioned in seven different ways in the verse. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Lord. Um, he is also the Spirit of wisdom, uh, understanding, counsel, mind, knowledge, and Spirit of fear of the Lord. Right? Therefore, if this interpretation is correct, the seven spirits, or not different spirit, but may refer to the complex ministry of the Holy Spirit, of the one Holy Spirit. Right? And maybe talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. Right? Those are not my views, I'm just showing you the views that I've been. be fine to summarize that as then the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. Is that a fine way to put that? No, uh, more so ministry of the Holy yeah, Spirit. Yeah, because yeah, it wasn't really basically natural yeah. discernment. So view, num view number two. Others see it as an explanation of the seven graces in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 to 8. Right? Where it says we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophecy is in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is given, then give generously. If it is, if it, if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Well, there are seven charis, charis not there, gifts. So the Holy Spirit manifests in humankind through these graces, reflecting the seven spirit of God, the seven graces of insight, help, help um, service, teaching, encouragement, generosity, leadership, and compassion. Okay? Romans 6, 12, 6 to 8. The third view, which I'm looking might be a little bit, to me, if I were to accept any of the three, I would go toward that one, right? It says the number seven can be symbolic to the completeness of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Not the fact that there are seven distinct spirits, the biblical understanding of the number seven represents completeness or perfection. So the sevenfold spirit of God would be the perfect spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, right? In summary, whatever you conclude about the exact identity of the seven spirit mentioned in the book of Revelation, we do not know that there is, we do know that there's only one spirit. So those are three views that I can find so far. I didn't find any other views on that. And you have to understand that people have put their time, people who love the Lord, to find way to explain this. Uh, um, theologians from the past and from present. 
and we hope again for the future because from every generation sometimes we have more clarity uh, because we build on the work of others and the Holy Spirit open our minds our hearts and give gifts to different folks right um, so which view is it I don't know for certain but out of those three views I probably would go more with the symbol of seven which means completeness or perfection that's what I would think anyone From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. Right? He rules. He's the mighty ruler of the earth. Then, after John does the salutation, John bursts out into a sudden oral expression of praise, which is known as what? A doxology. A doxology usually happens, like if you read Paul a lot. There's a lot of doxology in the writing of Paul. As he's talking about God, it gets so, like, he, like he's so amazed, he has to stop for a little while and come into a doxology. It gets, like, overwhelmed. To the one who is able to do exceedingly more than we can ever imagine, right? Or, or, or that's that Paul. And, that's, and I think that's what happened to, um, happened to John there. He sees so much of Christ. So much of the Father, so much of the Holy Spirit, you cannot not go into an doxology, right? Into oral praise of God, of who He is, right? But in the doxology, He says, To Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve His God and Father, to Him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. I'm not going to try to explain anything there. That's just a doxology. But in the middle of the doxology, John made a bold statement. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. So here is the major problem with being a total prayerless. Because John tells you how he's going to come. Right? He's coming with the cloud and every eye will see him when he comes. So you can't be a preterist because... Well, yeah, you can't be a total preterist. Right? You can't be that to say that Jesus has already come. Because there's not one church fathers who will attest to that who back this up and we know the word of god that this cannot be true right so especially here in verse 7 so here's the major again the problem with the um john attribute attributed the, to jesus not not only we see that but john also in this taxology attributed to jesus uh, to jesus the same eternal characteristic the Father possesses, right? To him, um, so um, to him, um, as we see in every concern, and all people will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll show you where it goes. So yeah. So the verse eight: I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Right? 
of sign for those, for, for those people who say that Jesus is not God. But John here in heaven is attesting to this that the same attributes, the same characteristic that we give to the Father is also given to the Son. Right? And in fact, you see, you will see in the book, he tries to worship the angel, and the angel says, Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just a servant just like you. But when Jesus is getting worshiped in heaven, he just accepts it because he's yeah. God. Yeah. Right? All right. After the brief salutation in doxology, John tells them who he was and that he was one of them. You know, some, somebody can't be writing to you about be encouraged, it's going to get worse. You know, stay in the faith, be faithful, and they're not going to the same thing you're going to. Right? It, it, it's like saying, oh, I, it's like somebody, their parents died or someone they love died. And then the, the, the counselor comes and says, oh, I know what you're going through. Eh, and you don't know what they're going through. You're not in their shoes. In fact, even if your mother died, it's still not the same experience. Right? Because you're not in the person's shoes. Right? But what John is saying to them, I'm not asking you to hold on as somebody who is far away from the suffering. I'm in the suffering too. Right? I'm in the suffering too. Right? He said, because he says, um, he too was suffering for Christ's sake. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom of in, in patient endurance that of ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God in the testimony of Jesus. Right? I was sent to exile because of that. Right? Then he goes to say, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which says, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Tyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Odyssea. So there are four things I see in those two verses that we can talk a little bit about. What does it mean by on the Lord's day? What does it mean by I was in the spirit? What's a loud voice like a trumpet? And we could also talk about the seven churches, right? On the Lord our days, on, on, on the days, on the Lord's day, um, is, I favor Sunday because historically in church history that those who converted from Judaism to Christianity adopted Sunday. As the day of worship, uh, as the Lord's day, the day to worship God, they forgo the Saturday, the, the Sabbath on the seventh day, and they adapt the first day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why, as Christians us today, we worship on Sunday. It's because it's a tradition. Yes. Do you think they possibly did that because Jewish tradition said they could not work? Saturday. So by moving it to Sunday allowed them to be able to not break the Jewish tradition and still be Christians. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Well, then why wouldn't they worship on Saturday? They finished with it. It's not like they were going to the synagogue and then and then go worship on Sunday. They weren't still going, right? Some people were. Okay. Some people were. Um, because Paul went to the synagogue all the time to um, to dialogue with, with with those in the synagogue, right? So they were they were they didn't again you have to understand for the Jews at that time they already knew that they were a covenantal people. So having Jesus in their life that's the that's the um, climax or the the accomplishment of that um, 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 covenant. So a lot of them continue to worship the same way they were worshiping, right? right? But also knew, and, and then some of them still participated in all the um, the Passover and all these other things. 
as Jesus did himself, right. right? So they didn't see it much different um, in a lot of ways. They saw a lot of things differently, but there's a lot of things that were not different for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right, it's not like when they converted, they suddenly said, oh, everything we used to do is terrible and awful, and we have to stop doing all of it, and now we do this. Yes, the only difference as well is when they start being persecuted, that's persecuted for being a Christian. That's when they begin to form their own sect, right? Uh, sect by having house worship, right? Beginning to worship together with one another. Because again, um, um, Acts, in the book of Acts, the Bible says John and Peter was going to the temple at the hour of prayer. It wasn't a Christian church. Right? So, but it's when they began to be persecuted, then the church began to worship in houses. Um, and then as they go along, when they first started, of course, it's a less than fair attitude. We do we do it a certain way, but once they, once we begin to grow, then we start structuring things a little bit more. Yeah. Well, too, when by then with the persecution, they pro they probably started on the Sunday also because they're afraid to talk, they're afraid to evangelize. Exactly. Uh, exactly. We need to yeah. worship yeah. on our own, yeah. right? To express ourselves the way we want to express ourselves, right? Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, um, I was in the spirit. We know that had to be, well, we, not only we know that had to be, it was a supernatural experience, right? Uh, an out of body experience or, or with clarity, or, or because the Pastor Paul says, I know men, and we know he's talking about himself, who went into, who went into heaven. We don't know if it's in the body or in the spirit, right? So, so but, but nevertheless, we know that it was a supernatural experience. He was taken to another dimension. Something that, that's not natural for a human being, right? And, and, and till today, till today, people can experience great things from God, right? Depending on their intimacy with God, right? Um, God can show them things that some people may not see, right? Um, but 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 at the same time, I'm, you know, as the Bible said, is to um, what what's the word I'm looking for? Is to test check, test, 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 test those spirits, right? Um, not everything. Somebody says the Lord says, or oh, I had a dream. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of Martin Luther King in the church, right? <laughs> I have a dream, right? They always have a dream for something. But still, God still speaks through dreams, right? God still speaks to people through visions, right? But at the same time, we still need to test those, those spirits and test those, those dreams. And the reason I can say this is because God gave me the opportunity to grow up in a Pentecostal church and, and, and to study. With, and to be with different denominations. So I can kind of evaluate certain things, right? And, and I gotta tell you, there was, in my, in my growing up in a Pentecostal church, there was, a, there was some lacking when it comes to the Word of God. And I tell you, I've, I've seen and experienced some powerful things as well mm -hmm. that God has done, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, a loud, a loud trumpet. A loud trumpet would, could signify what? Something important is about to happen. Yeah, he had to, that something important, an important message was about to be given, right? Um, he had a very, very important message to give to them. The seven churches. There were more than seven churches that were going through persecution in modern life. Why write only to seven churches? Why not eight? Why not all? Right? I believe this is a real letter written to real churches that had real problems. However, 
I also believe that the number seven is also symbolic of Christ's church as a whole. Right? That the number seven indicates completeness. So the letter is not just for the seven churches that are actual churches of the past, but intended for the churches to come as well. Right? Uh, the message in the book of Revelation is for them now in the future. It's almost like when I talk about a prophecy always has already but not yet. The actual present thing that's going to happen, but it also has a futuristic um, um, aspect of prophecy as well. That yes, this, these letters was written to those seven churches, but God also intended it for his entire church. Right? And that's the reason why we can still hope in the book of Revelation and find it find it to be meaningful to us because God intended it for us as well. Right? Could, could someone also say that the seven concerns addressed uh, in, to, in the list of seven churches are reflect the seven things to be all encompassing? Was there other things that were being concerned as well? You could, look at, you, could look, you could look at it like that. Did you guys hear what Herman said? Yeah. He said again. So the seven letters I'm asking to the seven churches, could those be brought up as all encompassing as the seven concerns for the church, or could it be thought that there are other things that can also concern the church? So Jesus has some concerns regarding some of the churches. Because again, remember you're living in a time of, well, we're living in, that, in a time like that today. Right? We're living in a time like that today. Where, where, yes, where yes means no, and good, bad is good. Right? <laughs> so, and, and, as, and, and as a person of faith, when you say what the Bible said, you might get, you know, uh, canceled. get canceled. <laughs> right? Get dismissed, right? Um, because, again, what do you do when somebody tells you, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm still mind boggling that we have to, people have to write behind their name, he, she, it, whatever it is. Oh, this is my pronoun. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. And, 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 and but today, if you, a Christian, have a, if you have a job, a meaningful job, let's say in public health, where I come from, right? A, a meaningful job, in, in the secular world, uh, what do you do? What do you do? Because I remember in the secular world, uh, one of the things that made me say, you know what? Eh, it's time to go. Right? Because again, if I'm sitting there, the guy says, oh, this is a card. I'm inviting you to my wedding. And when I open, it's like, I need to marry your man. Right? Oh, I can't go. Well, everybody else in the office went. Now you become the black cat, right? Sheep. Sheep. Well, black cat, black like sheep, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but then again, how do, you, how, do, how do you stand for your faith? And then what are the repercussions going to be? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to suffer the, uh, you know, what's, what's going to happen? And if you think it's worse now, it's just that. <clears throat> It's just that, right? So, be encouraged. Christ has won, already won, right? So John continues to write, I turn around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Again, as we know, the lampstand is the church, the churches. And the Son of Man is who? Jesus. Jesus Christ. How do we know that? We know that because Jesus told us he was the Son of Man. But we know that because we found the Son of Man also in Daniel chapter 7. Right? So Jesus want, this is why Jesus wanted, to, wanted them to know by the message, by saying that he was in the middle of the lampstand. Right? The lampstand for what? The churches. The churches. The Son of Man is who? Jesus wanted them to know that no matter what his church is going through, he is in the midst of his church. 
He is in the midst of the church. He is in the midst of the seven lampstands. Yes, you're going through what, what you're going through. In the midst of tribulation, persecution, and even when the apostles are being put to death and are being sent to exile, the Lord is in the midst of his church. And he is at work in his church. He is faithful in his promise to never leave you nor forsake you. No matter what the church will go through, the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is in the midst of his church. And he's faithful to continue that, right? But when John turned, he did not see the word, uh, the word who became flesh, right? Because the Bible says he turned, right? He did not see the word who became flesh and dwell about him. He saw him, he saw him like Daniel saw him in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Right? Because he says, I dwell with him, I saw him, we were with him, right? Um, but now you see Jesus in a different way. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led and, and was led into his presence. He saw the glorified Jesus, and he described what he saw. Right? The Son of Man was dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. Well, those type of robes could be emblematic of his ranking in heaven. He is the king of kings. He rules, right? When, when, whenever you are in the presence of the king with your robe, there is all something that differentiates everybody from, that, that differentiates the king from everybody else, right? Uh, and after all, all he is king, priest, and prophet, those were also robes that the priest used to wear in the temple. Especially when it says the golden sash, the high priest wore, would wear that in Leviticus, a golden sash, right? Jesus is the high priest as well. He's not just the king of heaven, but he's also our high priest, a high priest making intercession for us, for his church. So Jesus is doing his priestly work in heaven as well, right? Isn't it what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 tells us? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. So Jesus is not only over all what he's saying, that's what the message Jesus is giving by what he's saying is that Jesus not only the King of Heaven, but Jesus also is the High Priest of Heaven. That he's interceding for the for the um, for for the sins, and we will see that as the book proceeds. Right as we proceed into the book, we go into the book. There were a lot of things that could have happened to the sin had 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 Jesus not intervened, right? Had Jesus not intervened. Then John moved from the clothing to the person. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. I think he's speaking of his absolute holiness, the eternal power, the ter eternal eternality of God. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His eyes are like lasers. They see everything. They, this has to do with his omniscience. There is nothing that is going on that is unknown to him. So he knows what the church is going through. It's not like he does not know what the church is going through, right? His feet were like bronze blowing in furnace. He can take the heat. Uh, 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 when, when you're talking about feet, sandals, soldiers back in the days at those times needed good sandals, right? Because remember, they are fighting, they are going into the battle. It's not like, it's not like today where we have a sniper, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, yeah, I was shocked, I was watching this, um, I was watching this documentary. Guy was like 30 miles away and he could shoot somebody in a house? This is ridiculous. It's how far that technology has gotten. 30 miles away. Three miles? 
three miles away. Three miles, three miles away. Three miles away. Three miles away. Three miles away. But three miles is still far. But it's how far the person was, and they were able to kill somebody in a house, right? But soldiers didn't have that privilege. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? It's like the MMA fighters now in the octagon, right? You have to be. Um, um, we talk about the six feet fighting, the four feet fighting, and the zero fighting, right? Feet zero. So they have to have that. And you're talking about um, spears and stuff that they could plunge into your feet, right? So what you say, I can't tell what, what, what the message is saying is he can take the heat. He's ready to come to rescue you, right? He is not tired nor defeated. He can stand for his people, right? And we found the same thing in Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. As I looked, throne was set in place. In the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. Like wool. The throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were, were ablaze. River of fire was flowing, coming out from him. Right? So that's that's Daniel chapter um, seven. seven, verse nine to ten. Then John moved from his features, uh, moved, moved from his features to his to his um, to his voice is like the sound of rushing waters. His voice is like sound of rushing waters. The only place I could find that, I find that Ezekiel chapter 43 as a verse 2. And I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roaring of rushing waters. And the land was radiant with his glory. Um, uh, it's coming with full force, with authority, right? He speaks with divine authority. So, so what he says is true, and this mess, his message is true. When he says he will come to rescue you, he will give you victory and take you could take it to the bank. Right? Because out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. Again, taking symbolically, not figuratively. So we're saying not only does he, he have the authority, but he possessed all the power to do it, to do what he says he's going to do. He's omnipotent. He carries a double-edged sword. That is the judgment, the judgment sword. So now that the battle is not, so, so know that the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. Those who make you suffer will pay the price. Yeah. Didn't you once give a sermon and you used the two words to describe the power and the authority? Exousia is the authority, and then Dunam is the power. And that is why they said it was a double-edged sword, because he had the authority to do it and the power to do it, right? That's okay, you could look at it that way. Um, you could look at it that way. Um, but I was looking at it more so that um, the, the river, the voice coming like river, meaning he has the, that's the authority for me. And then the sword is the is the dunamis. I was looking at it that okay. yeah. And then he says his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Because when all is said and done, he will reign in his glory. Better yet, take you with him to reign with him. It says, when I saw him, I, fe I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and hate. So the Bible said, John, when John saw all these things, he fell as though dead. Why is that? The Bible says no one can see God and what? And live. However, because those who are in Christ have eternal life, even when we see God, we cannot die. 
Not anymore. He could fail us there, but it's not going to die. His, his holiness cannot consume you like the day of Moses. Now, Pastor Nixon was preaching about that. The reason why he said he's not going with them is because what he said, my, 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 my holiness might consume you. Stiff-necked people, right? Uh, but but Jesus died so that we can be allowed into the holiness, in the holy of holiness, right? So we can be in the presence of God. And the Bible talks about one day we shall behold Him face to face, right? And when we behold Him face to face, because the nature of the life He gives is not temporal, we cannot, we can no longer die and be consumed. By his holiness. Right? Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. It is wonderful. Where am I? Okay, let's go. Yeah. There you go. He is in oh he is in charge of the Yeah. And then and then Jesus says something, he, John says something. He holds the keys of death and hands. He holds the keys of death. And hate. Therefore, hold on even unto death. Because I hold the keys of death and hate. They can take the temporal life, but if you remain faithful and don't fall into apostasy, I can give you and will give you eternal life. Now, is that what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28? Do not be afraid of those who, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both the body and the soul. <laughs> right? Don't, don't fear what men can do to you, but instead fear God. Because men can only kill the body, but God can deal with both. Right? So he says he holds the keys to death and to hell. So he said, right therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Jesus himself tells us that the message was not just for them, but it's also for, for later. So where did the prayers even get their view from? It's so many times it's obvious. <coughs> will come, and, but for later, Remember the text? I, 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 I know because um, I've had, I've, I've always been, I've always, I've always walked back from having conversation with people when it comes to re revelation and the things of, um, uh, uh, of eschatology. Eschatology. Eschatology, right? But remember when Jesus said, um, even those of you who are here will not die right. before the coming yeah. of you the Son of Man. Yeah. I think they're taking that verse to say that the 70 in the 90s would be the latest years that you would still have for some people alive. Oh. Right? So you guys understand what I'm saying? Okay. So, so Jesus said, what verse is that? That in the, 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 the uh, transfiguration? Yeah. Or somewhere else? Uh -huh. you will not taste death before. Yeah, you will not, you will not taste death. Yeah. You will not taste death. You will not taste death since the world is lost. Until all the things have been transferred. Yeah. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. I think they're taking this verse. I think that's the basis for, for what they say. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And I don't necessarily, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that talking about the coming of Jesus Christ on earth. But I believe that's the verse. I can't remember if somebody had a a debate with me, and that's the verse they use for the predators' view. That the reason why the predators take that view is because anyone who lived during the time of Jesus, for instance, John was the last apostle, the oldest one to live, right? And if he's writing that, 
people, people that were living in the time of Jesus could not fast for nine months. Right. They would have been dead. So if he says that, then he must have come back. And somehow like the revival is dead. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying to you that's that's one of the verses that they use okay. for the prayer's view that everything has already done. Even Jesus Christ coming has already happened in the past. So how can you interpret this verse to to not make it sound like because it says, truly I tell you, some who are standing here, meaning alive right now, mm -hmm. will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Yeah, but what does coming in his kingdom mean? Yeah. Just go up to heaven. Was this after, that was, was that after? No. Uh -huh. When he raised up the... No, this is before I mean, he died. This was before his death. This is right before the transfiguration. Yeah. yeah. So what, is that what they were referring to? So are you saying that's what he's referring to? I think that's what he's referring to, yeah. Okay, that's a lot. Is there a chance, chance, look be, that? I don't know. Is there a chance that he could be just referring to John and saying, so you won't die until you have this vision of me coming back from Revelation? No, no, that's not Revelation. That's Matthew. I'm just saying the prayer states this verse. No, we can't, we can't, it's select, it's, we can't connect that with, with Revelation whatsoever. I'm just saying that's the verse they are using. They also use um, Matthew 24 on the temple and the stones as well. Yeah, the temple will be destroyed. The temple will be destroyed. Yes. What are the signs of your coming? So yes. Yes, I agree with that as well. I agree with that as well. Yeah. Um, so so um, I just brought that up just to say that's one of the okay. that's one of the things that they will use they may have used um, to say that Jesus has already come. Because he said not some of you will not die until you see the Son of Man come in this kingdom. Okay? So, yeah. All right. So, we're still, building, we're still building the ground before we truly get into Revelation. Right? The things that are important to, to know and to remember is that the purpose of the book of Revelation is not, primarily is not about the end time. It's a book that is there to encourage Christians that were suffering or that was even putting into martyrdom, right? That were dying for their faith, right? To tell them to hold on, right? Hold on to your faith. Don't fall into a apostasy. Look what's ahead of you, right? Look what's ahead of you. This is who Jesus is. This is the power he has. And he says he's coming for you. He's coming back for you. Right? Uh, the book is not about looking for all those little symbols here and there. Yes, that's not the primary purpose. Even though there is that in there. Secondly, because the book is an apocalyptic book, a lot of what is said in the book is symbolic because apocalyptic genre usually have symbolic languages and then sometimes a slip cyclical into their story going back again and again repeating the story third thing that I believe the the book is both for the audience of John, but also for Christian today and those who will come after us in the future if Christ there. Right? And lastly, what was the last one we talked about? There's one one is there's one of them that is escaping. Me. <laughs> no, no. Um, hold on. I think the last one is up here. Yeah. Okay. Lastly, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. 
There are times that they will explain it to you, but there are times that. Uh, after this, what this means, for me, it means both present and future. Um, it, again, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of stories that are cyclical. We will look when we get there, and then we'll make a decision. I'm just saying, for now, I favor that. And then, fourthly, understanding the larger purpose of the book of Revelation. Okay? Now, is there any question, statement, or remark regarding chapter one? Did I make it more confusing <laughs> or, or less confusing? Come on, come no, here. I, I think it's important to keep the primary focus. And I think that's why Bible studies on Revelation have gone mm -hmm. astray so often. Yeah because they haven't looked at what is the book about. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like, oh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. 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 Not like a question or anything, but the part where you mentioned that he was writing not only to the seven churches, but also to like all the other churches who come afterwards is, kind of makes me feel nice because it's like, he's not just reassuring these people, he's also saying, all you people, well, and you're going to go through these cycles of gets better, it gets worse. Yeah. You're, it's going to get worse for you, but also, <laughs> guess what? It's going to be great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm saying this again. <coughs> I'm, I'm saying the word seven churches because the only thing I'm thinking is there wasn't just seven churches. Mm. Why write to only seven churches? Is he saying something to us, right? That yes, it's literally for the seven churches. Uh, but at the same time, there's the idea of um, the totality of Jesus' church, right? Because again, the letter is to circ. I don't think they just circulate um, just the letter to Smyrna, just to Smyrna. Uh, I think at some point, different churches have the different letters, and that's how we ourselves, um, you know, come to have those letters as well. Well, not to mention that each of us now can relate to those definitely letters very specifically you can say oh my gosh we're the kind of church that's like xyz you know name one yeah so that's what we're going to talk about next week we're going to look at the seven churches mm -hmm. um and we're going to like look at we're going to cross reference them as well put them side by side um and see what god god what's the application for us right because he's literally doing the right now and and to come. And to come. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> All right. Um, Lord, I want you to pray for us, man. Right?